Last year, I purchased an M1 Pro MacBook Pro. At the time, I needed something with sufficient power and battery life to replace my aging XPS 15, which, for many reasons, wasn't holding up well over time. And honestly, even with their cringy marketing and claims for the device, Apple delivered. In my initial videos on my MacBook Pro, I demonstrated the ways in which it proved about on par with my desktop PC, a Dell pre-built with an 11th gen i7 processor and RTX 3060. The only real hitches were the compatibility issues, especially with regards to games. Half my Steam library was unplayable and high-end emulators weren't functional yet on macOS without virtualizing Windows. Plus, certain programs like Power BI just weren't available outside Windows. Still, it looked promising for my main needs of a machine that could be used to write scripts and edit videos without being permanently tethered to an outlet. All computers are fairly rosy in their first couple months though. After their honeymoon period wears off, all the jank and tiny issues start to come out of the woodwork. For example, my computer is technically my second M1 Pro laptop since my initial computer crashed hard and needed to have its logic board swapped. The computer was well within warranty at the time, but it didn't instill a ton of confidence in Apple's hardware, even if I haven't had any hardware issues since. But, you know, it's only over time that we start to see real degradations in performance and where minor problems get really annoying. So with that in mind, how has this computer held up over time? In a word, excellently, within reason. But before we unpack that, let me give the caveat that by rule, I typically stay away from Apple products. I'm not a fan of their closed hardware ecosystems or their confusing choices for consumer goods. I made an exception for the M1 Pro because it came along at just the right time with just the right feature set compared to the competition. But honestly, go look at my other videos. If I'm backing any brand, it'd probably be Surface devices, which have their own set of headaches. That goes double for my typical choice of OS. There are some definite benefits to occasionally using Linux to get certain tasks done, but I'm defaulting to Windows on most computers. It's honestly the most straightforward, widely compatible OS right now, outside very specific workflows. Nothing really competes with it for easily getting work done. Why am I caveating all this? Well, because I wanted to give context of my viewpoint when I say that macOS is terrible. Okay, terrible might be a bit hyperbolic, but it does constantly work against itself for actually being a comfortable primary OS for general productivity. Window management is unintuitive with no way to snap or maximize windows without multiple shortcuts or additional apps. Finder desperately needs windows detailed view and folder structuring. And it's very tiring to have to open an app I downloaded from a website multiple times to get past macOS security settings, with no way to actually change that behavior by default. Audio devices have also been cumbersome. Bluetooth earbuds like my Pixel Buds or Master Dynamic earbuds I bought in the past year always take additional steps to make them not sound like crap. And add to all that, the lack of a delete button on the keyboard and the awkward quirks of the function, control, option, and command keys, and I could go on and on for this entire video on the ways in which macOS makes me want to use a different computer altogether. But to summarize everything I want to say, I think I've been using this computer long enough to determine that the software is really the biggest downside to using this computer, which depending on your perspective might actually be a good thing. After all, the hardware has held up better than my expectations. The display is still fantastic, albeit a bit difficult to clean, with the notch never really being noticeable at any point in time. The keyboard's also still a comfortable way to write all of my scripts for this channel, and given the quality and loudness of the speakers, is one of the few keyboards on a laptop where I'm kind of fine with the trade-off of not having a numpad. I praised the trackpad quite a bit during my initial review, 
and it too continues to shine and be my preferred method of control for editing in Premiere. I've only had the urge to plug in an external mouse maybe once or twice, and that was while working on an external monitor trying to make really fine edits in Audition. Battery life also still trounces any other device I own, with the ARM-based Surface Pro 9 coming in at a not too distant second during actual usage. While I cringe at Apple's advertising for the battery on their newer devices, it's actually quite accurate. On a good day, I'll spend a full six to eight hours working in Premiere, Photoshop, and Audition before seeing the low battery notification pop up. If all those programs are closed, that can easily become 10 to 12 hours or even longer when not in use due to how good standby actually tends to be. It's the first computer I felt I could take to a coffee shop or on a weekend road trip and comfortably leave the charger at home. Combined with the premium all-metal chassis and... Uh, I honestly adore the actual practicality, feel, and heft of my MacBook. With the exception of it still not having a touchscreen. You know, I still really miss it. Especially when I need to edit an illustration. Regardless of what rationale Apple wants to give, I shouldn't have to buy an iPad or a higher-end graphics tablet to get a touchscreen to use with this device and it bothers me to no end. Still, if I had to choose between a touchscreen on my laptop and the actual performance of this device, I'm gonna have to go with performance. Right now, this lavalier that I have pinned to my shirt is streaming audio into Audition on my MacBook over there, which is what I'm gonna use to edit everything after I'm done filming this. All videos published to this channel since the initial review have been edited and rendered on my MacBook Pro, with the exception of one short we actually edited on a Surface Pro 9. Video editing just remains extremely smooth and very responsive. I used to think I might actually run into issues with only having 16 gigabytes of unified memory, but I've actually yet to have any problems with it. I do use proxies by default, and my timelines typically aren't the most complex I could make them. But, anytime I try to push it a little bit to try something new, I've never run into a roadblock that makes me want to move the project to a different, more performing computer. For me, that's a pretty novel experience, highlighted by how quiet the laptop actually is. I still don't hear the fans while editing. Ever. Which kind of feels weird, to be honest. I'll be sitting in my living room, working on a video, think I'm finally hearing the fans kick up, but no, it's actually my PS5 sitting across the room. It's wild how silent my MacBook is 90% of the time. But even with periodic cleaning, I have noticed it start to get louder over time when rendering. Although, full disclosure, part of that is likely due to a recent upgrade to our camera setup. We moved from a Galaxy S20 Plus for our main video footage to a Sony Alpha 7 III, and the footage is comparatively more complex and requires more effort to work with in general. I have also been fine-tuning export settings as I get more experience making these videos, so it might not be a surprise to hear that rendering a video with the highest possible quality makes the fans jump from 0% to 100% in very short order. Although, even with basic renders on smartphone footage for a TikTok video, for example, I do tend to hear the fans more these days than I used to, so maybe a firmware update did change the fan profile or something. Who knows? But when the fans start going, they're very noticeable. Like a sudden loud whoosh. Yet, even then, they're not quite as bad as other laptops I have lying around. It's basically a jump from eerily quiet to the normal sound floor for other laptops while doing mild tasks. On the gaming side of things, I've also started appreciating the laptop more as a general gaming device over the past year. Of course, not for playing anything on Steam. Uh, yes, it can handle the available games without an issue, but it's still a limited library with performance that I'd rather leave up to my desktop or Steam Deck. Nah. I've actually been using it for emulation more than anything. 
I've done quite a few videos on handhelds like the Analog Pocket, Steam Deck, and Retroid Pocket Flip, as well as accessories like the GB Operator. For each of those videos, the variety of ROMs stored on my laptop slowly increases. With OpenEMU integrating so well with the system, I'll wind up randomly playing Tetris for 10 to 15 minutes or trying out a ROM for a random system before I stick it on one of my devices. And it's a pretty great experience. The interface is clean and organized in OpenEMU. Whenever I launch a game, it also seems to automatically associate itself with the file type, so there aren't any extra hoops to jump through to launch a random game via Finder. If you have a macOS device, the convenience alone is enough to try it for yourself, to be honest. Even the UI for changing keyboard bindings in-app is extra clean and easy to understand. Clicking on a button on the picture of the console itself highlights which key is associated with each button. Per device mapping is super easy, even if the default layouts are already intuitive and special keys aren't buried below several additional menus. Honestly, so much of RetroArch's intimidation on every other platform would disappear completely if it were this easy to set up an update. Even if it's macOS only, it's great to have something like OpenEMU feel so good to use, and it's a key reason why I use my MacBook for emulation in the first place. Outside OpenEMU, Simu also got an update not too long ago to work with macOS, and it's been great for some quick Mario Kart 8 races. Even though there's uh, occasionally some graphical issues, I honestly don't mind the occasional jank to have a game this nice run so smoothly. Breath of the Wild also runs quite well. I can set it to 1080p and get about 40 to 50 FPS, with any stuttering coming down to shaders compiling. I still probably prefer to play Breath of the Wild on my Switch OLED for more consistent performance from the start, but man. This game has always looked great and looks even better on such a large mini LED display. The only downside to Simu's current build is a lack of optimization for ARM-based Macs. Everything's running via the Rosetta compatibility layer, but it runs so well, I'm sure most people won't know the difference unless they're really looking or trying to push render settings to the max. So, yeah, my MacBook Pro with M1 Pro still has great performance after a year of constant use with really great hardware, incredible battery life, and some cool new emulation options opening up as time goes on. The only real downsides I've noticed have to do with weird decisions Apple's made with Mac OS. If this were a less performant machine, I probably would have sold it by now. That's how annoying I found it in general. But there's enough goodness here for someone like me, who's mostly interested in using the device for writing and editing these days, that I'd genuinely recommend it to anyone with the same use case. Especially if you can find one secondhand at a discount. Of course, Intel and AMD haven't fallen asleep at the wheel. Intel's 13th gen processors have largely caught up to Apple's M-series chips in raw performance, and AMD is exceptionally good right now at making some pretty efficient chips and compact integrated GPUs. Plus, Apple since released the M2 Pro, which does have a modest performance bump over the M1 Pro and Wi-Fi 6E support. As such, the M1 Pro MacBook Pro isn't exactly the only option on the market that's slotted into my specific use case these days, which is honestly pretty great, especially if you need more performance than battery efficiency or vice versa. There are an incredible amount of options popping onto the market right now, and I love a good competition. I typically refresh my laptop every three to four years and will be interested to see where the market is at around this time in 2025. For now though, as long as my logic board doesn't spontaneously destroy itself, again, I'm guessing this laptop will still be running great even when I start casually shopping for its replacement. Those are my thoughts though. I'd love to know yours. Have you been looking at the M1 Pro as a cheaper alternative to the M2 Pro MacBook? Are you an M1 Pro user yourself? with your own experience or frustrations you'd like to share. 
let me know down in the comments. And as always, if you found this video interesting or informative, go ahead and click that like button to let me know. Then remember to get subscribed so that you don't miss any tech-related videos in the future. If you'd like to support the channel, there are links in the description to our Ko-fi and Patreon pages where you can throw some extra cash my way and make sure I have enough coffee to continue writing all these scripts. And if you'd like any additional coverage on the M1 Pro MacBook or macOS in general, feel free to let me know either in the comments or over on Twitter. That's going to be all for this video though. Until next time, catch you later.